It's Live in the Bream with the host of Fox News Sunday, Shannon Bream. This week on Live in the Bream, somebody I am so excited to meet myself, but to share with you as well. Uh, Paul David Tripp is a pastor. He is an award-winning author. He is a speaker. He's got great stuff on social media. If you need um, just daily inputs, um, some spiritual growth in your life and some challenges and wisdom, um, he has got a devotional book. He's got many books, but my favorite of his, New Morning Mercies, is one that I use almost every morning, and I'm so excited to welcome him to Live in the Brain. Paul, great to have you with us. Thanks. It's so good to be able to do this. Okay, so you've got a brand new book called Reactivity, How the Gospel Transforms Our Actions and Reactions, and a lot of this looks at just kind of the state of where we are as a society. When you talk about reactivity, I think of everything from social media to having debates with family or friends that get too <laughs> political. Uh, what are your concerns and why did you feel like this book could help? Well, my concerns first developed from social media. Um, and when I started uh, posting on Twitter, for example, I was excited about this wonderful medium of, without leaving my chair, how many people I could impact. But in this real way, uh, social media has become a dark place. Um, and it's sad to see the the level of anger and disrespect and mockery um, that lives there every day. And here's the thing that concerns me, Shannon. The Bible says we speak out of the heart. I only have one heart. And if I grow used to doing this electronically, this kind of uh, nastiness of communication, Mm -hmm. surely that will begin to bleed over into the principle friends, family, and work relationships of my life. And that's something that should concern us. It's true. I think that it sort of eats away at some of the fabric of respect and of what you would say to someone's face that you might not, um, you know, it might be different than what you would say behind a keyboard or behind a, a pen name online or an avatar that doesn't really expose who you are. And you're right. I think it does sort of loosen the standards of of how we would be willing to engage with someone. Um, but sure, as you said, we, de- we develop yeah. habits of communication that we don't just break because now we're face to face with with a person. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It reminds me of one of my favorite verses. I think about um, Philippians four eight, talking about whatever's true, whatever's noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. Those are the things we're supposed to think about. And sometimes it's hard to do that when you're on Twitter. Yeah, it is. And I, one of the my favorite verses. It's it's this verse is one of those passages, Shannon, that rescues me from me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's t- Ephesians 4.29, it says of our communication, we should say, speak only what is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to the hearer. So mm. I speak uh, in a way that I want you to be better because of this communication. Mm -hmm. I want to remember whatever situation you're in, whatever the problem is that we're talking about. And I would like my speech, my talk, my communication to give grace to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I literally, I could have written this book, Reactivity, just out of that one verse. Mm -hmm. Because it's just not what we're doing. Uh, You know, we've, we, we, it seems like we love controversy. We love piling on. Uh, you know, if you you want to build a big Twitter following, be controversial, be angry, be a bit disrespectful, um, and and those those things are always damaging. They're always hurtful. The most false uh, common proverb in the world is. Sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but names will never hurt me. Mm. The opposite is true. Long after physical bruises, those cruel things live in my heart and affect me, sometimes even change me in a lasting way. 
Yeah. Uh, we're talking to Paul David Tripp, the new book, Reactivity, that he's got out, how the gospel transforms our actions and reactions. You talk about those wounds that we may get from the way that we talk to each other and attack each other. Um, and social media is relatively new in the existence of humankind. Do you think it will be a little while before we see some of the longer term effects of what we're doing to each other right now on these platforms? Well, I think there's evidence already in the short ter- term. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I do, it, it's I think it's the most important thing I'm doing right now, although I'm known as an author, is I mentor 14 young pastors individually. I meet with them for two or three hours. I love these guys. I have a great sense of honor, privilege for doing that. But often they'll show me uh, something on their phone. It's a text that was written in the middle of a sermon Mm. by somebody who is angry by something they said. Now, that's in the church. That's Mm -hmm. during a worship service, for God's sake. Or the angry things that people say to them on the way out of the church. Now, that begins to uh, picture for me that these, these digital habits are bleeding over into important places in our lives. I I will say to you, I was a pastor for many years. I never had to deal with the kinds of things my pastor friends are dealing with today in the angry, accusatory, disrespectful way that people communicate to them when they're upset about something. Mm -hmm. I think about that, about just childhood and what kids are going through um, and how this has changed things. But you're so right about people who are in ministry. And I feel like Gosh, the last couple of years have been really difficult for a lot of people in a lot of ways. But I think about pastors and ministry leaders trying to hold people together when they're sick and when they are frightened and when there are political debates about everything from vaccines to lockdowns. I would imagine that um, pastors have really felt beaten up, many of them, the last couple of years. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But, but let, let's, let's talk about children for a moment. If... If I've been sitting on my uh, in front of my computer in all the moments that I have at work, and I've been uh, part of the the angry kind of tribal controversies that are out there, and that becomes habit for me, do I really think as I get home I'm going to become an entirely different person? Mm. I think I think that that already children are probably uh, bearing the brunt of our letting down our standards and talking to one another in a way that we, we just should not. Uh, you probably know the name Tim Keller. Mm-hmm. Of course. Uh, I I love Tim. Tim and I have been colleagues, and I, I I'm very thankful for his influence, but. I was scrolling through one of his comment uh, list of comments to something said, and, and somebody just said, dude, just shut up, shut up. And I'm thinking, well, this is not an invitation to communication. It's not the advancement of a, an opinion. It's just a digital punch in the nose, mm-hmm. which, which may I say, harms the speaker as much as it does the person receiving it because it's harming to me if I let down my standards and I become comfortable with that kind of communication. Mm -hmm. Right. And this does kind of take us in some ways to the lowest common denominator. So I know that you address too the worries about cancel culture. You said how some people like to have a following. They think they, they can increase those numbers, those likes, the clicks, whatever it is, by being more controversial. And I think sometimes people are looking to catch someone else, whether their intentions were good or not, where they stumble in something they say or they're misinformed about something or you read it the wrong way. Um, are you worried about those who are caught up in cancel culture who don't it doesn't seem to be there is a valid reason for canceling them some people there's a valid reason but it seems like many of these cases are people just looking to attack someone else and destroy their career or their lives i can say to you beyond uh shadow of a doubt the thing that gets me up in the morning is i live in a world where redemption is still possible Mm -hmm. amen 
where for, where forgiveness is still possible, mm-hmm. where we are given the opportunity to live in a brand new way. Listen, I am far from a perfect man. I won't be telling him on the other side. I need mm-hmm. grace every day. I need forgiveness every day. I need Amen. patience and kindness and understanding every day. And the cancel culture means there there is no redemption. You step over whatever line and you're done. I mean, we've seen uh, people who said something when they were 15, 16 years old. Mm-hmm. Now as adults whose life get destroyed mm-hmm. by something stupid that they did as a teenager. Listen, I think God designed teenage so we have a few years where we can just be stupid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you, 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 you literally cannot have government work. You can't have the church work. You can't have the family work. You can't have friendship work if there's no redemption. Mm-hmm. And how hopeless life would be in that place. Um, I think about, I'm so glad, as you said, you know, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Every morning I start before the Lord and thank him for that. I think that those of us who feel um, God's forgiveness are so grateful for it and willing to extend it to others only because we know we're all imperfect. And I think about, um, you know, a lot is written or said about Mary Magdalene and the fact that those who received what they felt like was the most enormous gift of forgiveness from Christ um, were the most grateful and the most loyal because they knew how much they needed it. And that's all of us. And I do think when we look around at other folks and um, are willing to uh, cut them off because of some mistake or some bad decision, there are none of us left to cast a stone. I mean, none of us. So that's I do it, that's, think that's important that's right. to remember. Yeah, something is is gone wrong inside of you if you think that you have risen to such a level that you are beyond the fear of ever being ever being canceled, and so you become one of the cancelers. I mean, mm-hmm. come on, uh, that's that's not any of us. Uh, Dangerous. You know, it's it's the way I say it in shorthand is no one gives grace better than a person who knows he needs it himself. Exactly. Exactly. That's a perfect way to shorthand it. We'll have more Live in the Bream in a moment. Again, we're talking to Paul David Tripp today, his brand new book, Reactivity, How the Gospel Transforms Our Actions and Reactions. Um, Talk about how we can get caught up in this as you kind of referenced it there, feeling superior or feeling some sense of power by the way that we, um, you know, talk to other people or categorize or shame or punish them. Um, with our own superiority. And I, you know, I, I think all the time about, you know, I grew up in a church when I was very young that was really legalistic. And it was sort of encouraged that you'd look around and say like, oh, gosh, look how great I'm doing. That person is horrific. We caught them going to the movies or something really, you know, scandalous. And I really had to unlearn that as an adult. Like, listen, we are all sinners saved by grace. Those of us who choose to walk that path. Um but that idea of judging other people and, and finding sort of an arrogance, whether it's, you know, spiritual or secular, it's very dangerous, too. Well, I think there's two things that, that are important here. One is cancel culture is a cancel is a culture of self-righteousness. Mm-hmm. If, if, if you can, are able to look with honesty at your own life and, and say, as we've said, there's never a day in my life where I don't need forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Then it's hard to look at one mistake a person has made and for you to write them off completely. So mm-hmm. uh, I think that the, the cancel culture is, is shockingly self-righteous. I think another thing that, that encourages cancel culture, it's tribalism. What tribalism mm-hmm. says is my group is right. End of conversation. And so I have, a, I have the right to cancel anybody who is outside of my particular tribe. That, that can be family. That can be a type of church. That can be a political system. The renditions of tribe are, are endless. But the minute I think 
I'm part of the righteous collection. And therefore, you, by the very nature that are outside of that, that gives me the right to do things that I shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. And, to, and to judge you for everything that you're doing that doesn't line up with where I'm at, whatever, as you said, it, it, it can be anything across the spectrum that we kind of worship or adhere to um, that gives us a sense of feeling or uh, of belonging or of superiority or of um, any other negative thing that can be found uh, under the heavens. So what is the yeah, good news? It, How do we get better at this? The good news is that, uh, first of all, the Bible is a source of incredible wisdom. It speaks to all of these things. Uh, but but here's the here's the real good good news is that a holy, righteous, almighty God looked at sinners and didn't cancel them. Mm-hmm. He sent his son to forgive them and to restore them to what they need to be. And God's grace, I, I love this, I cling to this every day, is not just forgiving grace, it's empowering grace. When you cry mm-hmm. out to God and say, I need help, I don't want to be this kind of person anymore. God never looks at you disgust. He never turns his back. He never mocks you. He never walks away. He gives you mercy in your time of need. And and we just can't, can't let culture devolve to the point where there are no more themes of grace. Mm -hmm. You're so true. So right about that. You do write so effectively about grace. I find it to be so encouraging because we're all going to need it at some point. Like you and I agree we need it every day. But I think, you know, even people who aren't, you know, deeply religious or have a strong faith component, they all know at some point we need grace in life. I mean, we're human beings. We're flawed. We're fallible. I don't know else you move through the world if you don't have that. And and you write so eloquently about this in-between that we're in um, until it's... As you said, you know, the other side, when we have a chance, um, you know, to be redeemed for eternity um, and not be the struggling sinners that we are right now with whatever we're dealing with in our own personal journey in our life. Um, And grace is such a key component of that. As you said, like we need it, but to extend it to others, too. Can I tell you a quick grace story? Yes, I'd love it. I, I, I was a young, beaten up, discouraged pastor. I thought. I just lived with criticism, and some of it was justified. I didn't know what I was doing, but all I wanted to do was run. Mm-hmm. And I went to the leaders of my church and said, I, I, I can't go to another meeting. I, I can't preach another sermon. I just want out of here. They didn't want me to leave, but they realized I was done. And the next Sunday, they stood with me as I announced my resignation. It was very emotional. I had planted that church. I had been... For many people, I was their only pastor. At the end, when everybody had left, I was the last person out of the building. I was locking the door. I turned around, and an older man in the congregation, the oldest man in the congregation, said, Paul, can I talk to you? I didn't want to talk to anybody. Mm. And I said, sure, because I thought I should respect him. He said, look, we know you're immature. I thought, well, this is a great start. (laughs) Uh, Thank you, sir. (laughs) But then he said, But where is the church going to get mature pastors if immature Mm. pastors run? We love you. Don't leave. Mm. Mm. Tears streamed down my face. And I walked home. My wife, Luella, was already there with our children. And I said to her, I can't leave. Oh, my goodness. My my word picture was God God nailed my shoes to the porch of that church. Mm. Now, think about this. Without... One sentence from one man, this wonderful life that I've lived would not have happened. Mm -hmm. No books would have been written. I don't know what I'd be doing. I needed somebody in that moment to speak words of grace to me. And it reminds me that words have power. They're like a hammer. You can build beautiful things with a hammer, or you can bash somebody's head in with it. Mm -hmm. 
and and we can allow ourselves to use the the beauty of words to harm to tear down when they can be used to build things to rescue things and literally for me to send my life on an entirely different traje- trajectory mm-hmm. I love that story. I've often wondered, knowing that story about you, how you unwound things after you had stood there in front of the church and said, I'm leaving, I'm out of here. Um, I can't imagine. Can I tell you? I, I would love to hear it because I've always thought, oh my goodness, how did he go back to them and say, just kidding, I'm staying. I called, I called uh, one of the church leaders and I said these exact words, okay, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I panicked. Sometimes that's our best place to start. I I know this isn't typical, but can I unresign? <laughs> and <he laughs> and I guess they said sweet. yes. He was very sweet. He said, we would love for you to do that. Oh. And the next Sunday, I confessed that I had panicked. And the church wrapped their arms around me. And I was there for many more years until God led me on in ministry. Mm-hmm. I love it. It is such a beautiful picture of grace and, you know, just the real injury we can do to people, but how it does, like you said, just takes those kind words to refresh someone's soul and to put them on a path that has now had a chance to change so many other lives. And we are so grateful for that. Those of us who have understood and and enjoyed all of your writings and your teachings. And um, I come across you every day on Instagram. And I would tell people, if you want to see some interesting conversations and be further encouraged, um, check Paul David Tripp out on social media. The new book is Reactivity, How the Gospel Transforms Our Actions and Re actions. Thank you so much for being with us on Live in the Bream. It's been an encouragement. Well, Shannon, thank you very much. I I appreciate the opportunity. God bless you. 